Well, I am glad that you're here for our third part of Spice Tithing. This is an interesting week for us. And if you grab your handout and follow along, hopefully you'll be able to, to follow the, the, uh, the, the sermon this morning. So very excited to be in this topic. And it is such an amazing chapter where Jesus is really just eviscerating his, his audience. The scribes and the Pharisees are, 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 are a group of people that believe with all their heart that they can follow the Old Testament law and gain grace. And Jesus is protecting you and I from that message. And he's trying to help them to be in their rightful place. Here's the big idea for today. Our big idea, our big idea is taking the text we're about to learn and squishing it down to a, a manageable sentence. Sometimes it's a run-on sentence, but that's okay. This isn't a grammar test. God is much more interested in our hearts and attitudes than he is concerned about how we present ourselves. That's the big idea today. Our faith is all about becoming like Christ. Everything that we do is supposed to be emulating Christ. Not under rules, not under uh, strict uh, guidelines to gain grace, but that we, because of grace, are going to be obedient to the commandments of Jesus. It's a different way of thinking. For example, let me also preface, uh, and we, we can go into this another time too, so this might be new for you. But I want you to understand, when we talk about tithing in the Bible, tithing in the Bible is completely under the law. Does everybody understand that? When the Bible talks about the word tenth, it's under the law, and it is always for your crops, your grains, your livestock. It was primarily so that the, the, the people of the Levitical priesthood system... Could, Levi was the one tribe that did not receive a land inheritance. And so other, the other tribes were gr growing grain and, and harvesting things and had livestock. And they were to tithe on that every tenth one. So even according to the Old Testament, if you had nine of something, you didn't have to give one. It was the tenth of it. So if you had 19 of something, you'd give one of it. Make sense? That was tithing in the Old Testament. They also had a national tithe. The national tithe was for the feast days to keep the feast days going. And so when Jesus came and fulfilled the law, now we give out of a cheerful heart. Now we give to be like Christ. See, Jesus, Jesus himself was, had complete riches in heaven, came down and humbled himself to be like a man. Jesus gave everything up to be like us. And Jesus fulfilled the law and he gave up his wealth to meet the needs of us, the poor. And so when Paul comes along, if we had more time, we could go there. When Paul comes along, he says things like the gospel is free. He says things like to, to not to, that it's that it's that it's uh, the, the pastors that will, will keep you tithing are the ones that are that are wolf in, in sheep's clothing. That they are a hireling, that they are uh, keeping people under the oppression of the law. The Bible says principles like this. Jesus says that when you reap much, you sow much. That's a little different. That if I'm generous with my checkbook, I don't, we don't need any salads or livestock in here. That's okay, because I don't know what to do with that. But <laughs> if you're generous with your checkbook this morning, the principle in the New Testament is if you reap much, you'll sow much. God loves a cheerful giver. You are not obligated by rules to tithe. That's why we don't pass a plate here. The box is back there. If you want to give, you can. It's between you and the Lord. No one will ever call you and say you're behind. Okay? The principle is, if you've been blessed much, you give much. And we can do that, that another time. But these folks here that he's speaking to, they still believed that if they were to go into their cupboards and go like this with their salt and put 10% of it into an envelope and go through this, and, and they're so careful to do that, but they were complete jerks to their neighbors. And Jesus is like, you've missed it. Let's dive in in Matthew chapter 23, verses 23 through 28. Let, here's a supporting text before we jump in. You've heard this before. Samuel said, hath the Lord uh, as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? You know what he's saying there? He's saying, listen, does God have the same love for sacrifices as in obedience? He says, behold, to obey better than sacrifice. 
It's better to obey the Lord than to live like the devil and give a little bit of money and say, ha, huh. I had somebody one time that, this is a very strange way to say this. I had, I had a, a friend of our family's one time, they kind of turned squirrely. They bought my kids Christmas presents and my kids loved it and it was wonderful. And then all of a sudden this, this person had their own set of problems in their life and they, they really hurt my family and tried to talk bad about my family. And <clears throat> so that was kind of interesting. And the, one of the responses to a mutual friend of ours was they said, I have every right to treat them like that. I bought their kids $150 worth of Christmas presents. I'm like, I didn't know that's what presents were for. <laughs> I didn't know. I'm going to give you this $100 and now I own you. You ever met anybody like that? It's like, hey, we're going to give you a free cruise. And you're like, no, no, we don't want it. Because <laughs> you know if you take it, that person's going to be like, you know, last year... And so Jesus is saying, listen, you know what's better than, that, better than giving something? Give me your heart. Just obey me. Far better. Here's the setting, just like last week. He's continuing his scathing discourse against the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees. Verses 23 and 24. Let's read together. Jesus continues, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe. There's our word. Of what? Mint and anise and cumin these are spices and herbs. You guys are so careful to still. And by the way, let me all make another statement. We're going to do a study on tithing in the Bible. You'll never find a monetary tithe in the Bible. It's always grain or livestock or something else. You'll, you can't find it. It's not in there. So he's going to them who are still tithing herbs. And he says to them, for you pay a tithe of mint and anise and cumin, but you guys have omitted the weightier matters of the law. And Jesus says this, judgment, mercy, faith, that ought ye ha to have done and not to leave the other undone. He says, listen, if you want to still give to the storehouse, do it, but it doesn't buy your way into living however you want. Here's, here's the principle. For those that are very involved in legalism, there are a lot of churches this morning that are involved in legalism. They say things like, this is how you're supposed to live. The pastor says, don't see this movie. Don't listen to that music group. Don't do this. They're not using Bible for it. They are just simply telling you how to live. Whereas at True Grace Church, what you're going to hear is this is the principle in the Bible. Go and pray and ask the Holy Spirit how he's going to direct you and your family. And then we all just love on each other and encourage each other that we would be obedient to the Holy Spirit in our each individual family. That's the Bible way. And so, but these people were going through and they were taking, like I said, their anise and putting 10%, oh, that, uh, 90, 10, okay. And, and the, the, the mint, oh, there's about 10% in this cumin. And now, okay, I've got my tithe of these things. Now, this is what, let me just tell you psychologically what this does. I have now tithed on my herbs. I can go be a total jerk and gossip to people, but I did this. I did this. Now, another thing that legalism does is it allows me to now go through the roster of the church and through my family members and through my neighbors, and I can look at people and I can say, aha, Chris did not tithe on his mint. I am so much better than him. Boy, have you heard about Chris lately? You heard about this guy? This guy just uses mint and doesn't care at all about God. I mean, what an ungodly guy he is back there, Right? Now, I am now better than him because I have this little tiny thing down, but I'm talking bad about my brother? That doesn't make sense. So Jesus came and he said, and I don't know what Chris does with his mint. That was just an illustration. <laughs> but this is what legalism does. So Jesus says in verse 23, he says, you've omitted, you've totally ignored judgment and mercy and faith, the things that matter, the weightier things, Jesus says. Look at verse 24. He calls them, he says, this is what you are. Here's his illustration. You are blind guides. Now, I've been to uh, the Dominican Republic. I enjoyed so much going to the Dominican. When I was at the Dominican, I can't tell you how much we depended on our guide. There was a, one of the missionaries there had a, a, a Dominican guy. It was just he's such a sweetheart. He was so great, and I was so thankful. He was bigger than me, and he, he was very loud, and I was very thankful for him because <laughs> we had some people come and try to take money from us, and he's like, oh, and he got all upset. I think I told you that story one time about we had lunch at Christopher Columbus's house. He wasn't home, but we did go there and, uh, and it was interesting and we had a whole big thing, but this guy protected us. He knew where he was. He went and yelled at the other people and told them to leave us alone. I was very thankful for him. 
But you know what? The Bible says here, these people are blind guides. I'm so thankful that day that that man helping us, the Dominican, I'm glad he wasn't blind. Because we were going some, if anybody ever been to Dominican or maybe the Philippines, the driving conditions in those places, I mean, I literally was just like this. I'm like, and I'm a confident driver, but I'm like, just Lord, just, I can't, this is insane. I remember one time, I'll give you one quick story and I could go on and on on these, but they are so, I mean, first day there, the missionary said, I'm going to take you guys for ice cream. And I'm like, great. He goes, it's not for the ice cream. And I went, huh? He said, you'll see. He took us to this corner place that was real busy. And he said, I go, is the ice cream here just amazing or something? He goes, oh, it's, it's okay. Not really. It's whatever. I go, this is autumn. We drove, you know, 20 minutes to get there. We get our ice cream. Yeah, get whatever you want. You know, we got, I'll have a scoop of whatever. And we got our ice cream and he goes, you ready? And we still don't know what he's talking about. We're like, ready to eat this? He's like, follow me. We're going we're gonna to eat this outside on the, on the, uh, with the tables outside. We take our ice cream and go to the tables outside. And as we're sitting there, all of a sudden, we are on this, I don't even know what you call it. We would call it an intersection here, but I, there was no structure to this at all. It was total chaos. It was heart attack within lanes. It was the most stressful thing I've ever seen in my life. Just going by traffic, every which, I mean, and I'm sitting here going, oh, I don't even think I took a bite of ice cream. He's like, huh? We sat there for an hour, and this is our first night there. I had my camera, like, using all my film. Whoa, did you, whoa, and we're just, we couldn't get over it. I remember, yeah, it was like the turnpike, kind of like the turnpike. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, we saw a family of five on, a, like, a Vespa, if you know what that is. One on the hip, somebody in front, two in between, you know, shirts over, you know, Pete's on the back, I mean, like what? I'll do, one time we, I remember we were so close to this big box truck one time and I had like 15 or 16 teenagers. I was responsible for their life, you know, so I'm projecting confidence. We're going to be fine. Lord be with us, you know, <laughs> but I, I remember we were so close to this box truck one time and I had the camera in my hand and I was trying to show the camera like this. I'm like, look how close it is with traffic here. And I, the window was down and I just went like this and I touched the truck next to us. We were at a red light. And I touch the truck. I'm like, look how close we are. This is the car next to us. And I'm going like this. I kid you not, below my arm, a scooter. I'm going, oh my goodness. I, I just, I freaked out. I couldn't believe it. I mean, they're literally just, bu they bump stuff all the time and wave. You know, they hit each other. Okay, yeah, you're, no one gets upset. Okay, you're good. I'm like, they don't have Geico. Pretty sure. Just, I'm glad he wasn't blind. Jesus calls these people in verse 24. A blind guide. And this is what they do. They strain at a gnat and they swallow a camel. So he gives them two ideas here. They're a blind guide. So they're leading other people like this. Come on, guys. Follow me. The second way he's describing them is they strain a gnat. What does that mean? Well, it very well could be that this is what Jesus meant. I meant to have a cloth with me this morning. But if you have a cup here, if we're having a party outside... I'd have my cup here. And what they would traditionally do in Israel when they were having a party outside, whatever the juice was or whatever they were drinking, they would put a cloth over the cup they were serving you. And the cloth would go over the cup they were serving you. And then they would take the pitcher and pour into your cup through the cloth. And then before they served it to you, they would then take the cloth off and hand it to you. It was a filter. It was a purification system. And any of any little bugs or anything that might have gotten into the juice that was open would be filtered out. And they would be essentially straining a gnat. They're so cautious to do this to make sure that it was a, a good presentation and make sure I don't get any of this in my mouth. It'd be gross. But yet this giant animal that has a thousand fleas on it in just one armpit, you're devouring like it's nothing. So Jesus has this illustration. He says, you guys take the time to strain a gnat. But you swallow a camel. What does that mean? I'm so careful to pay tithe on my salt and pepper, but I treat my fellow people like garbage. Here's the takeaway that I got from this. Focus is everything. Whatever I stare at long enough and to which I give my attention will eventually become my priority. If I'm focused on people, I'm going to really, really do a lot in investing with them. If I'm focused on self-righteousness, I'm going to take the time to do all these little things that don't amount to anything. In fact, it's worse than that, as we've seen. My life will be a giant success if I just focus on Jesus. I'm tempted to go into turn your eyes upon Jesus. Remember, we talk about that all the time. For the things of this world will grow strangely dim. I love that. Verse number 25. So he says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make 
clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within are full of exhortation and excess. And so Jesus is talking about this incredibly disgusting practice. In fact, this practice is so terrible that I don't think you would go to any restaurant that practiced this practice. This practice in verse number 25 is these people essentially were making sure the outside of the cup was totally clean, but the inside is disgusting. Here's kind of the takeaway from this. I think it's such an obvious application. Making sure that my plastic external appearance is pristine is not beneficial for anybody. Hey, if I come through these doors and I'm, and I'm struggling in life, I'm struggling with peace, I'm struggling with finances, I'm struggling with health, I'm struggling with relationships, and I come in here and I just pretend like there's nothing wrong, I go, wow, I got it all together, how about you? And you're like, yeah, me too. Nobody's helped with that. In fact, it hurts everybody. And Jesus is like, why, why, why are you so focused on cleaning the outside, but your insides are disgusting? Wouldn't it be better to start with the inside and say to everybody around you, pray for me, God's totally changing me from the inside out? So much better. So he says, make sure, oh, this is the takeaway, is making sure that my plastic external appearance is pristine is not beneficial for anybody. Not only is that lifestyle worthless, it is also exhausting and emotionally confusing. How many of you can identify with that? I, I'll put both hands up. It's, 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 a, it's, a not, it's not a good way to live. There's total freedom and stability in Jesus. Verse number 26. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Now, <clears throat> I am actually, there's a new restaurant in town in here, and I want to encourage you to go to it. I have a, actually, I, I got an advertisement from this new restaurant, and I wanted to show you this morning. In light, Let's read the verse one more time. It says, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse that, of cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter of the outside of them may be clean also. He's like, hey guys, you know what would be better is to clean the inside of the cup first and then maybe then the outside after the inside. But just the outside and not the inside is probably not the right order. So I wanted to show you this, this brand new um, restaurant. It's called Kenzini's. And uh, I wanted to welcome you to Kenzini's. It's a new restaurant in town. But here's... <laughs> Here's the uh, slogan. You see our cup there. That's, that's a brand new cup we're going to offer you when you are seated in our restaurant. But here's our little slogan here at Kenzini's. We always wash the outside of our dishes. So that's pretty good, right? And any extra food found inside your cup or bowl is on the house. Because, hey, when you're here, you're family. Okay? <laughs> so this is just how many of you want to go to Kenzini's? How many of you would, would tell your friends about us? I mean, if a restaurant really advertised this way and said, hey, it's no big deal. We always keep, we clean the outside of all of our cups. If you find something on the inside, it's a bonus. You'd be like, that sounds so great, I'm in. You'd be like, I wonder how many days that'll last, how many hours that will last before it's shut down. You would look at that and say, what? That's disgusting. They're advertising that, and Jesus is looking at them saying, you wouldn't eat at a place like this, but we're very comfortable living a lifestyle of this spiritually. And so in verse number 26, our takeaway can, can be something as simple as this. Jesus is intensely interested in the inward parts of me. Just like as a consumer, you're interested in the cleanliness of the, of the bowls and the plates of the place you want to eat. Jesus is looking at me saying, I want the inside parts of Ken. Can I just be totally, totally transparent with you this morning? I know that as the pastor of True Grace Church, and I love this church and I love the people in it, I am shooting myself in the foot by teaching you guys some of the stuff I'm saying. Is that fair to say? I am not giving myself job security by teaching you some of the stuff I'm teaching you. Why? It's my job to be honest with you. You say, well, most of us don't believe that. I've never been taught that. I can't change what the book says. So I've just determined I'd rather work at Home Depot and there's nothing bad on Home Depot. I'd rather work at Lowe's. I'd rather work at UPS than to stand up here and not present accurate truth to you. That's just where I'm at in my life. Because I've learned that when I go home from here, and when I go home from Wednesdays or from a counseling session, or when you call me and we do a Bible study over the phone, here's what I know. Some people won't agree with me, but I have, I've been doing this since 2002. I have right now more peace in my heart than I ever have worshiping the Lord, ever have been in a church, 
ever have trying to be in ministry because I know that the, the inward parts of me is what I focus on now. Man, I was really good at standing up here with a suit on. Some of you saw parts of me with that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But man, I, I've, I've played the game. I know how it works. I know how to lead a business meeting. I know Robert's rules of order. I've been there, okay? I'll tell you what I enjoy now in my life. I enjoy saying, Lord, this is so hard. Life is hard. I didn't think it would be like this. There's parts of my life I didn't think would be like this. But God, you have all of me. You have the inside part of me. And that might get confusing on the outside sometimes, but I am not going to forsake the inside for the outside anymore. Jesus is intensely interested in the inward parts of me. We have an inside-out faith. Those who try to force an outside-in change on themselves or others will only see temporary and, by the way, not only temporary, but insignificant changes. So many teenagers I've had in my youth groups over the years, their parents are so strict on them with these rules and they, you will not go see that. How dare you hang out with that person? And there's no mentoring about the heart of Jesus and why we're supposed to be separate. Why sanctification? Why we serve the Lord out of love? Why we serve him out of, and out of the abundant grace of God? Almost 10 out of 10 times, the teenagers that have the hardest parents that don't take the time to teach them the full volume of this book, but just pound rules into them, almost 10 out of 10, I would say, turn their back on the church, turn their back on God when they're 18. Because for the first time, somebody's finally not over them. And this is what Jesus is talking about. Verses 27 and 28. Verse 27, 28. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchers, which is to say a big, giant, fancy coffin, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Now, Jesus uses the cup illustration because all of us can identify going to a restaurant that has a disgusting cup on the inside. I call that place Golden Corral. There are many names, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm like, can I get the plate that hasn't already been used, or is that not today? Or... Okay, okay I'll, just, I'll just scratch it. I'll scratch it off. I'll scratch it off. Wow. I, Lauren's favorite restaurant is Golden Corral. And I'm like, I always think of it as like, Oxygen tanks, food on your plate, nine bucks for lunch, whatever. No, no, no. You've been to Golden Corral lately? They're like, that'll be $72,000 and your right arm. I'm like, I'm, I'm never coming here again. It's so expensive. Woo! Anyway, I would enjoy going there with lunch with you. Absolutely. I'm just being silly. All right, verse 27. He says, Well, and you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you're like whited sepulchers which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. He says, you all can identify with the cup illustration, but let's take the cup illustration, Jesus as a master teacher and telling us exactly what we need to know. He takes the cup illustration of the restaurants and he now takes it one step further and notice the direction he's taking it to a life and death scenario. Because Jesus always brings it to a life and death scenario. Because the gospel is there that you might have everlasting life. The gospel is there so that one day when Jesus returns, he will resurrect the dead and start his kingdom with those he resurrects. This is the power of the gospel. Jesus isn't passionate about dirty cups. He's trying to prove the point that if you're not clean on the inside from the washing and regeneration of the word of God and redeemed, and when he returns, we're born again in him and that we experience new life. And we're resurrected one day because he's the resurrector and we will never again face death. If we're not in him in that sense, it's completely worthless. And so he brings it to the matter of life and death in verse 17. He says, some of you are like these whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within are full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Verse 28, he says, even so also ye, even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men but within are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Here's the takeaway that I got from these verses here. There are some beautiful cemeteries, first of all. I can remember as a kid, in, I grew up in West Seattle, and I can remember sometimes there's nothing, nothing beats a Seattle summer day. It's just beautiful. 
I, I always miss it. I'm not sure if it's worth the other nine months of nasty, but it, but a Seattle summer day with a nice cool breeze and seeing Mount Rainier carved beautifully on the Seattle skyline is just like, this is incredible. I, I could lay, as a kid, I frequently would just lay down in the grass and take a nap. But you do that here, you'd wake up half eaten with a fire ant. I didn't even, I didn't know ants bit you when I grew up, you know? We had this cherry, I gotta tell you, we had this cherry tree in our backyard. It was a Rainier cherry tree. We owned one of those. I just saw those at uh, BJ's Wholesale the other day. Little tiny thing, ten ninety nine Rainier chairs and going, I could have made a fortune. I can remember when I was a little kid, I used to climb this Rainier cherry tree. Rainier cherry trees are so cool. They have these branches that are kind of like this. And as a kid, I remember climbing up it and you kind of just kind of lean back and you'd find almost like a, like a bed with the way the, the, uh, the branches are. And I remember just being up there and it was, it was a very strong tree, but it moved a lot. It was kind of a narrow trunk. It was went up probably 30 or 40 feet. And I remember as a little kid, I'd get towards the top and I kind of felt like it was my little fort and I'd kind of just go up there and lay back. And I could remember just swaying in that thing as a little kid. And you kind of look up and pull down a cherry and eat that. And, rah, rah. and I, I loved that. I was like my little fort, man. I loved it. It was a Rainier cherry tree. I loved it. It was so amazing. But I can remember on those days like that, that was just perfect. A couple of times my mom said, I want to take you guys to the cemetery. We're going to look for somebody's gravesite I've been meaning to look for some family member that was in the military that I wasn't familiar with. And I thought, mom, you want to go where? I had an intense fear of death or anything related with death. when I was a child. Remember I was in my first funeral home ever. There's a man that lived with us. That was in my dad's church. He got old, couldn't take care of himself. My dad's like, come live with us. And his name was Chet. And we have some amazing family stories about Chet that are getting passed down to my kids now. And uh, Chet died and we went to his uh, the, the, the only part of his funeral was me and my immediate family. So there were six of us there, my mom and my dad. And I remember we sat there and the, I told my mom, I was sick to my stomach. I said, I can't do this. I'd never seen a dead body before. And I just, I can't do this. I cannot do this. I remember I was five or six years old. And I just, I can't do this. And of course there, the casket was open. And there's a guy that I have known that lived in our house laying in a box. I'm like, I can't do this. I can't do this. And of course, my, my mom just so lovingly, it's going to be okay. You can hold my hand. And she was so amazing. Of course, my brother, who's three and a half years older than me, was like, he's going to open his eyes. And I was like, no, I couldn't, I just couldn't handle it. And so we were sitting there. First time I ever saw a dead body in my life. I'm just behind my mom, just like barely in the room. I kid you not. My dad says, let's pray. It's just our immediate family, us six. Of course, my dad's still doing a pastor, like full. We're going to talk about this guy's life. I'm like, <laughs> hated it. So my dad's like, let's pray. As soon as my dad said, let's pray, my brother squeezed my hand real tight as if like, here it's going to happen or whatever. I kid you not, when he squeezed my hands, the lights flickered. I kid you not, lights went, then I went, I'm out, man. I was so terrified. So I had this fear of death when I was a kid. Ironically, I grew up to be in firefighting, so that's kind of, uh, you know, different. But I remember my mom wanted us to go to a cemetery. Let's go to the cemetery. I thought, oh, please no. I was probably nine or 10 at the time with my fear of death looming. We got there. It was beautiful. This lush grass, beautiful fountains, amazing headstones. It was a wonderful, beautiful day. And I always remembered that, how scared I was. And when I read these final verses from Jesus, this is what I can think. There are some beautiful cemeteries. I thought of that memory when I was writing that. They all have one thing in common, though. The graves are all closed. Jesus is the one spiritual leader, the only spiritual leader, who came to this world and said, let's open the graves. Think about it. Every religion on the face of the earth wants the graves closed. They want them screwed down, nailed down. We're not going to look at the reality of sin in your life. It's all external. And Jesus is like, let's open all of them up. I want to see the worst parts of you. Do you know this morning, can I say this as we close? Jesus knows the worst parts of you that you've hid from everyone else. And he still loves you more than you can imagine. That's my savior. This is how I felt would be an appropriate response when I got done studying this. And maybe you might feel the same way. Just maybe something I prayed with myself. Maybe you can join me in it. Lord, help me to not try to trick you. How foolish is it to try and trick God? So foolish. Lord, help me to not try to trick you for you can't be tricked. Help me to be real with you, with who I am to you and others and ask you to change me to become more like you every day. 
You say, you, maybe you're here this morning, you'd say, Pastor, oh, aren't you scared to tell people that a tithe is not required? Not at all. Not at all. Because my Savior, every day, is making me more like Him. Every day I submit to the Lord, help me be a better dad, help me be a better husband, help me be a better pastor. I want to just look like you. And every day he's just chipping away the parts that aren't him. You know what he did for me? He gave all, all the, the wealth of heaven and became poor for me. And the closer I get to him, the more I just want to be like that. And the Bible says when I, when, I, when, I, when I sow things in him, I reap things in him. And something clicks in my brain where I'm no longer under the law, but I give because I want to. I want to be like him. He's my savior. He gave everything for me. No longer will any man control or stand with rules over my spiritual life. But one has set me free. And for the first time when Jesus came, mankind was true and, and, and able to obey out of freedom. That's my God.